Early this month, the United States assassinated senior Iranian general Qasem Soleimani, claiming he was undermining security. But does the United States really care about democracy and good governance in the Middle East? Soleimani was Iran's second most prominent public figure and was commander of the Quds Force, the extraterritorial wing of the country's Revolutionary Guard, or IRGC. Now, that's a bit like the SAS, just a lot bigger with its own ballistic missile program and aviator sunglasses. Lots of them. Soleimani was killed because the United States claimed it had information revealing imminent attacks against American targets. On an imminent threat, and those threat stream included attacks on US embassies. Period. Full stop. And yet, there's little to confirm that. Indeed, the hit so far has only served to escalate tensions in the region. But you might have noticed that even those critical of the action did a lot of <clears throat> throat clearing regarding Soleimani, saying he was not a good guy. Now, I'm not here to deny that. After all, we're talking about a career soldier who specialized in proxy wars and covert operations. He was loved and revered by some, hated by others. Think Napoleon. Alexander the Great or Jack Nicholson, a few good men. You can't handle the truth! What is more, he was an extension of Iranian foreign policy in the region, which many view as being at odds with democracy and human rights. But here's the thing. Soleimani might have been a bad guy, but he wasn't all that different from any of about five dozen current and former American politicians and bureaucrats. Indeed, if anything, he was considerably more restrained in his use of force. Yes, he was involved in a lot of bloody wars, but so was every US president since 2000. And besides, most of the wars he fought in were started and fueled by America. If he's liable for extra legal execution, where would we draw the line? Hypocrisy? You bet. But does that explain why so many Iranians dislike the West? Iran has experienced significant protests in recent months, but the response to Soleimani's death has been nationwide mourning in a huge display of Iranian nationalism one which is stronger and far more anti-colonial in content than many on both sides of the Atlantic can begin to comprehend. The question is, why? To answer that, you have to go back to 1901, when William Knox Darcy first negotiated an oil concession with the Shah of what was then called Persia, Muzaffar al-Din, in exchange for exclusive rights to prospect for oil across most of the country for the next six decades, the Shah received 20,000 pounds, two million, in today's prices, an equal amount of equity in Darcy's company, and 16% of any future profits. By 1908, it had become clear that this was an astonishing deal for the Englishman, and within a few decades, the refinery at Abadan in South Iran would be the single largest in the world. The Anglo-Persian oil company, the predecessor of today's British Petroleum, was now a global energy giant. But despite tapping such extraordinary abundance, the people of Iran saw little return for this geological good fortune. By World War II, the British Exchequer received more money through taxes paid by what was then the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company than Iran itself received in royalties. This was for oil in their own country. It's kind of like a football agent demanding they represent the next big thing and then take home more of their paycheck than the player themselves. This is important when considering the post-war welfare state, because while Britain could have built it without foreign oil, as was the case with Sweden, for instance, it would have been unable to do so while maintaining its global military reach and reducing its national debt. Furthermore, the strategic importance of Iran's oil went beyond just the UK. A report published by the US State Department in 1951 noted that the loss of the country's oil on the world market would significantly impact Europe's economic recovery which was a problem given the prospect of Moscow's rising influence on the continent. Of even greater concern, however, were projections regarding a crisis based on the loss of Middle Eastern oil altogether, a very real possibility given growing nationalist sentiment in the region and the demise of Europe's empires. For Washington, this would make European rearmament something of critical importance in arresting the spread of communism impossible and would force profound changes in the economic structure of key allies in the recently formed NATO. Little of this concerned Iran's new National Front, a political party led by Dr. Mohammad Mossadegh that fused national, popular, liberal and social democratic forces around nationalizing the country's oil. When word reached Tehran in 1950 that the threat of precisely that had persuaded the Arabian-American oil company Aramco to a profit-sharing agreement of 50-50 with Saudi Arabia, it seemed inarguable that Iran should follow suit. But there was a problem. With far less money than the US, Britain had no interest in a similar arrangement regarding what was then the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company. 
with defence spending above 10% of GDP and domestic politics requiring greater government intervention than nearly ever before, Britain just couldn't afford to renounce these massive resource revenues. In February 1950, Mossadegh, along with several other members of the National Front, were elected to the Majlis, Iran's parliament. That November, the Majlis Oil Committee, now headed by Mossadegh, recommended the rejection of the oil supplemental programme, a proposal designed to defuse the argument for full nationalisation. Mossadegh's manoeuvring was opposed by the new Prime Minister, Ali Razmara, an establishment voice who was against national ownership. In March that year, Razmara told the Majlis that Iran was incapable of running its own oil industry. Three days later, he was assassinated by a young militant attached to Fadayin Islam. From there, events moved quickly, with the impetus shifting behind the nationalisation movement decisively. That March, the Majlis overwhelmingly approved the oil nationalisation plan before the Senate ratified it just two days later. By late April, Mossadegh himself had been anointed as the country's new Prime Minister. Oil nationalisation and Mossadegh's elevation should have been the founding moment for a modern democratic Iran. Here was the emergence of something that Britain and the United States have always since claimed that they want, a democratic government based on principles of constitutionalism and national sovereignty. Now, there was still a monarch, Shah Reza Pahlavi, but he was subject to the rule of law and constitutional monarchy, a bit like the Queen is in Britain today. Furthermore, Mossadegh, previously a lawyer, was secularly minded and would in time oversee land reform, the introduction of social security and a deeper separation of powers. Yet, the response from Britain's Labour government, which had embarked on a pretty similar agenda at home, might sound familiar. They threatened legal action against anyone who purchased oil from and refined in Iran. As a result, the country's industry came to a halt, and after several failed attempts to reach a compromise, Dean Acheson, then US Secretary of State, concluded that the British were determined on a rule or ruin policy in Iran. American indifference meant Iran's fragile experiment in self-government briefly endured, but that changed with the election of Dwight Eisenhower in 1952. After entering the White House the following January, Winston Churchill persuaded him that Mossadegh, while a secular liberal, would have to work with the country's Moscow-aligned Tudeh party. Consequently, the two men agreed to remove him through what would come to be known as Operation Ajax, an ultimately successful coup funded and coordinated by the CIA with British involvement. That meant re-centralising power in the unelected monarch Shah Reza Pahlavi, unwittingly laying the foundations for the country's Islamic revolution that would remove him in 1979. Confronted with a rising nation whose pursuit of self-government and public ownership was perceived to be at odds with their national interests, Britain and America removed an elected leader and empowered an autocrat. It wouldn't be the last time. And Mossadegh? He was sentenced to three years solitary confinement in 1953, after which he remained under house arrest until 1967. Because of fears of how his funeral might be politically received, he was denied a public funeral and buried instead in his living room. To understand the revolution of 1979, which brought to power a repressive regime which, yes, is anti-colonial in nature, you can be both things, you have to understand the removal of Mossadegh by the great powers two and a half decades earlier. Britain and America demonstrated that self-government would not be tolerated and that their calls for democracy in the Middle East were hollow and hypocritical. So when people say Soleimani was a bad person, maybe. The thing is, the West undermines, removes and even kills the good ones too. Until that ends, it has no moral high ground. Rather than serve the cause of democracy, they'll continue to sabotage it.